My name's Alan Smith. Um, I'm a lighting cameraman, so hence the reason I'm a bit picky about how you do this camera setup. Um, I started uh, my career at Bournemouth College of Art, so I guess at your age I was at Bournemouth doing film and television. That was three years, and um, then I was lucky to get a job at the BBC, uh, just like that. But it wasn't in the job that I wanted. I got a job as a film examiner in a film library and I was stuck there for three years, but it was the same department as the department I really wanted to get into, which was the film department. So um, I got there within three years and was a trainee, trainee assistant film cameraman. And after a year you come out and you are an assistant, full assistant. And I was a full assistant for years, a long time, but I had a great time. So I did four years drama, four years documentaries, and then I started doing operating on things like Bergerac and um, little dramas and then a lot of documentary and that was all on film and then in, in the 90s tape came out, videotape and all the cameramen didn't want to do that so I volunteered, said yeah I'll do it, I'll do it and got myself a job for four years on an arts programme called The Late Show and that was how I learnt how to mess around with tape uh, nobody ever watched the programme but hey, I didn't care because it went out every night. So I was able to see what I'd shot and that way you learn. And then from there on I went through to the 2000 and uh, the department closed. And so I ended up um, going freelance. So I've been freelance ever since the last 13 years. So what would you say are the main differences between the Not and then becoming a freelance? The issue is pay. At the BBC, you're a staff member and you get a salary and your money goes into the bank account every month. You don't have to put in any invoices, you don't have to do anything. It was brilliant. As a freelancer, you have to think about everything and you really do have to think about money. And you need to know what your rate is, you need to fight for that, you need to then chase people for payment because, you know, four weeks will go by and you still won't have been paid for that one or two days you've done. So it's a hard world when you're freelance um, and you have to think of a lot more things than you did when you were at the BBC. What these ones here? Um, that's Colin Farrell's helmet from when he charges at the elephant in Alexander. Have you seen Alexander? Yeah. yeah. You know when he's charging the elephant? Yeah, that's the one he's wearing there. Uh, <coughs> that's the bit that was kicking around the floor. That's actually from Troy. This is quite an interesting substance because they actually spray it into a mould, spray it and pull it out immediately so it's spray, pull and it goes hard. It's, it's weird stuff. I just made a plume for the top which has since fallen off. Um, <clears throat> this is the electroform stuff. These are pulls from the mould but sadly the rubber is perished now because we did Queen Amadella's stuff in Phantom Menace. None of the other films because then it all started getting CGI'd but uh, we did all the metal work on her head here for that. And this is the latest thing that we're working on, working on the design for this, which I've signed a confidentiality agreement, which I'm not allowed to show anyone at a college, but tough. This is for the new Ridley Scott film. Um, it's called Exodus. It's about Moses. It's going to be shit. None. I've had no education in anything to do with media. I've got a, I've got a woodwork CSE. Yeah. And so, how did you get into... Um, I bought out a little manufacturing company that had been going for hundreds of years that made ceremonial military equipment for the army, mostly plumes, some headgear, but mostly plumes, so household cavalry sitting on the horse, that onion-shaped horsehair plume, we make those. But the army was getting smaller and smaller, not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, we, I knew, realised that there was scope to move us into other areas, so I contacted assistant costume designers. First I contacted, you know, just reading them off, off um, TV screens on the credits, uh, costume designers, none of them interested. But if you get talk to the assistant costume designers, um, and I think that would probably be the case in any kind of uh, field, whether it's costume, makeup, props, the assistants are the ones who like to know who they have can get to make stuff. So that's that's what I'm telling people today, go for the assistant. Not, not the bottom assistants, but the, the second sort of row of assistant um, costume designers, assistant prop makers, 
um, whatever. They're the ones who like a list of who can specialise, because our stuff is very, very specialised. It's military-style plumes with some kind of some sort of metal work. Um, so and you've got, I've got my name known around them, and then your name spreads. Oh, we're making this historical thing. Oh, there's a lot, uh, the costume's got lots of plumes. Sort that out. The system go. Oh yeah, I met this guy who specialises in that. Right. It's that. How do you get their contracts? Do, do they come to you, or do you come to them? Um, now these days, it's they always seem to come to me. But it's because I've got a, a reputation. Um, before then, it was. As I said, try and get, try and find out who co assistant costume designers are, because they're the ones who decide who's going to make something. So the assist, the, the costume designer, does does a a very average picture, then gives it to an artist who does a much better picture, and then gives it to an assistant who who works out the kind of dimensions and stuff. They're the ones you've got to talk to. Um, so, in your experience, what have you found the most useful? Um, being self-employed, I much prefer that because I've always been self-employed. Well, not always, but for most of my life I've been self-employed and it can make you very arrogant because <laughs> you can tell people, no, I'm not doing that. Um, and it gives you a lot of free time so that you can pursue your hobbies, you know, and turn your hobby into the next um, career. So it can be quite lonely being self-employed, especially if you work from home like I do, but uh, I have an assistant who comes in a few days a week and I've got some outworkers. But you, 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 you are on your own, you have to sort out your tax, you have to talk, sort out your VAT, um, and you have to be totally self-reliant. Most self-employed people work very hard. I'm an exception. I don't work hard, I'm actually quite lazy. It sounds like I work hard, I don't. Um, but you do have to make sure things are done, even if you're like lazy like me. Who are you and what do you do? My name's Rhys Davis. I'm um, a composer and sound designer working in theatre, film and television, gallery installation and online. Okay, and within your role, what were responsibilities designed? Um, to do, um, signify the visual text with sound accompaniment, including Foley sound, atmospheric sound, and dialogue, um, and to compose incidental music, uh, depending on what the project is, whether it's uh, a corporate or whether it's a movie. And how do you get into like, doing sound? Um, yes, I mean, I didn't. I, I took a different route, but um, my students, because um, I've never had a lesson in sound, it's all self-taught uh, or industry trained. But um, my students, yeah, they'll, they'll either go and do a postgraduate. Um, so one of my students this year has just gone to the National Film School to do sound design uh, or Bournemouth, or they will use their showreel and get a runner job and then work in the sound department. A lot of them, I mean, another one is now was boom swinging for um, the BBC. Um, the thick of it, the, the political comedy, the thick of it. Within the creative industries. Yeah, like um, you know, you do like, the soundtrack, or you like the, like the funny artists. Oh right, okay. Every single sound that you hear or see in a film um, is done is not actually recorded live on set. Um, so every time somebody puts their iPhone down on a chair, like that, we're not recording that sound. It'll be me with something similar, with a big screen with that shot and a microphone, and me timing it so it matches in. So every fist punch, every footstep, every slurp of tea, every explosion, every single sound that you hear is done by somebody like me in post-production. Um, and a Foley artist is a, an artist who um, uh, records or, or signifies action sounds. So footsteps, fights, skateboarding, it doesn't really matter. It'll be somebody with a microphone. I've done different things in my past. I'm a teacher now, so I don't do so much. I, I can't work in the industry because... Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about uh, at one time. I was um, rung up by Frankie from a production company called Evolutions. Evolutions. 
um, and she, they were doing a big conference um, and she wanted me to write the theme to Star Wars and orchestrate it, but not, it not be the theme to Star Wars. So something very similar, but not copyright. This was just before The Phantom Menace was about to come out. And I said, well, you know, that was done. You, you, you had six months to write that, and it was done with the Hollywood Orchestra, and you asked me to do it on a computer and a synthesizer overnight. Um, I said, I, I, it can't be done. And what she'd done, she'd assumed that she could use the real music. Am I going too long? OK. OK, real, use the real music. But because Phantom Menace had just come out, the copyright had been banned. They, nobody's allowed to use that music again now. Um, and so she panicked and asked me, and I said I couldn't do it. I used to do a lot of work for Revolutions, never asked to do another job again. And so when you're at university, you can't, you haven't got, you're not 24 seven sort of free. So if they want you to do something like that, and I'm in the middle of a class, or I've got to do something to do, I can't do it. So I can't be professional in the industry that easily anymore. Because you're a sound designer. Yeah. Were you at some point a Foley artist? Um, I've, never, I've never been a Foley artist. Um, professionally, I teach it. I teach Foley, um, but no, I was always I was a, I was post production. So I I was I was linked in with music a lot. So the kind of work that I did was creating sounds for objects that had no analog in the real world. Like what sound does a a, a, a chrome football spinning down a tube make? You know, it doesn't it doesn't make any sound in the real world because it doesn't exist. It's CGI.